Okay, uh, so moving on to this session on uh, version 4, a uh, preview of version 4. <coughs> it's going to be our next version. Um, what I'll do first, I'll go through some of the, the minor bits and pieces that we've done with it, and then um, once I've done the minor sort of feature uh, enhancements, Chris is then going to run through the webcam capture and just do a little demo of that, just so that you can see how it works. And then I'm going to show the kind of um, the main uh, feature of version four, which is live streaming. So, again, straw poll: which organisations that are here do live streaming? Lots. Okay. And is it which uni which universities that are here do live streaming other than graduation ceremonies? Okay. Because that's all I seem to hear about. <laughs> right now. Great. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> so, yeah, we... Oh, I haven't got my lapel, lapel mic on. Better do that. So, yeah, we hear a lot of people doing um, uh, graduation ceremonies. I mean, again, just out of interest, the live stuff that's done... I mean, just... Straw poll, is it kind of guest speakers? Uh, what, what sort of stuff are we talking about? What's other than guest speakers? Because I kind of know that scenario. Any, anyone else got anything else that they do that's interesting? Concerts. Concerts, yeah. Uh, Sorry? Conferences. conferences. Yeah, performing arts and drama. Yeah. That sort of stuff. Lunch hour Regularity of these things? Every lunch hour or? Twice a week. Twice a week. Okay. So <clears throat> the business case for doing a live streaming feature actually didn't come from the UK. It came from the US, where they're crazy about that sort of stuff. And um, I, my gut feeling was that people didn't do that much of it in the UK, but I'm, I'm definitely being proven wrong by that. And when we show the live streaming feature to people, people just go, great, we would definitely use that. So it'd be a useful exercise to show it to you guys. So, okay, first minor feature that we did, and a lot of these... Um, they're sort of small things, but they, they make a big difference. Is now, if you go in as an administrator to the, the system and you want to assign a piece of content that has been kind of passed to you to, into a particular personal category, you can do that. So there's this little sort of man icon that you click on that I've highlighted there, and it brings up a whole list of users. So if you want to assign some content to a particular user, you can do that within the media library. That's my understanding of that feature anyway, if I'm not, <laughs> I wasn't heavily involved in that one. The other thing as well, and this is just a minor thing, but this does make a big difference. And I, I definitely find this when I'm working with Dave on support bits and pieces and we're installing a media library for the first time. You kind of want to know that it's working. And one of the things that we never had in our software was a way of actually knowing that the encoder was running and how far it was through, through the file. It would just basically say encoded, you know, in progress or whatever, yes, no, and there were certain flags that you could tell it had failed and it hadn't, and it wasn't really that user-friendly. <clears throat> so what we've introduced is this kind of um, dynamic percentage encoding thing, so that if you look at your queue of content, you can actually see the percentage that it's through on a kind of per uh, single percentage basis. You can see how far it is through the file, which is really, really useful because you, know, you can tell how, how long it's going to take approximately as well. So we never had that before, just a little thing. But from an admin's point of view, that is invaluable, I would say. This is another one that potentially would, would help with kind of marketing and PR and, and maybe just from the point of view of making it easier to embed a video, in inverted commas, because this isn't really embedding a video. But now, that link there that used to say copy... I can't remember the exact terminology. I think it was copy URL, it used to say. We've changed it to just say copy link now. And when you copy that link, rather than it going to the media library page that's got the content with your embedded media player and all the other stuff around it that the media library has, it just goes to a page that has the video on it. That's it, just the video. And it's a responsive video as well. So it means if you make that page smaller, the video will get smaller with, with how big you've made the page. So it's, it's quite cool for that, because it, it just means that, you know, 
in the old days of doing this video streaming stuff, people would say, oh, I quite like the way that I could make a link to the file available. So when you were using things like Windows Media and Real Media and all those sorts of things, you could basically make a link to the file. People would click on it. It would boot up their media player and it would play the file. Whereas now, because we're using things like Flash and iOS, you always have to embed it in a page, and it's a bit more fiddly to do that, although it looks nicer. This way of doing it is sort of like a, a middle ground, because you're providing a link to someone, so they're comfortable, I just click on the link. But we used to find when you provided a link to the media library page, they didn't necessarily want all the stuff that was around it on the media library. They were just like, I just want the video. I don't want all this other stuff. So it just goes to the video, and that's it, no, nothing else. And it's responsive as well, which means you can resize it. We're introducing support for JW Player 6. This, I mean, it is a pretty boring slide, this one. I, when I was doing it, I was like, oh, that doesn't look very good. But JW Player 6 is the latest version of JW Player. JW Player is the player that drives the playback that we use. So it's the thing that you embed in the web page. JW Player is an industry standard way of doing it. Pretty much every website by YouTube that's out there uses it. And it just enables you to have that playback experience where if you go to it on an iPhone, it'll play on that. If you go to it on Android, it makes a decision based on which device you're on, the, the kind of player to render. Going to JW Player 6, uh, for us, is, is a way of, one, having a potentially a nicer player skin, but two, there's a whole load of different benefits with it. One of the things, actually, that I was going to talk about when John was talking about accessibility, and I forgot, was that um, this player has within it an, an accessibility element. You're all more up on this, aren't you, Chris? The, the thing where you press a, if you, oh, yeah, the keyboard, shortcuts. keyboard shortcuts, that's it. So JW Player 6 has keyboard shortcuts in it so that if you are using, you know, you, you aren't able to use a mouse, for example, you could just use keyboard shortcuts on a kind of, you know, a, a key, one of these, um, what are these kind of keyboards that uh, are made for people that couldn't necessarily access a, a you know, a standard keyboard? So JW Player 6 has that in it. It has a, a nicer skin. It supports a whole load of different things actually within, within the player. And there's a whole host of different benefits that we're going to get from it. One of the things uh, longer term that we're going to get from it is the ability to support multi-rate streaming as well. So that we will get away from this kind of high and low thing and then the player will just do it automatically. So that's another benefit of going to JW Player 6 as well. Responsive embed code, a lot of people have asked about this. We've provided a, a little bit of a workaround in our current software in order to make our player responsive. So the JW Player 5 that you use now, if you, if you are on a, um, on a particular device that, that has a you know, very uh, narrow resolution, then the player can, can resize to meet that. But there is a workaround in our software to make it do that. This particular embed option here, this 100% 16 by 9 embed option, would mean that if you embedded the player in a web page and the resolution of the screen was very small, you're on a phone or whatever, the player will dynamically resize to meet the resolution of whatever's there. So you, you shouldn't have any issues on any particular device with the player being too big for the browser. We get asked this all the time because there's loads of these CMS systems out there that you can embed media into that are mobile friendly. And it's becoming more the case that this content is watched on mobile devices. So having an embedding option, again, a relevant that asked me the question in the, in the break, having a, a responsive one as well is, is good. Although how many universities out there have a responsive web page? Do you know, does anybody know if their, their, web, their homepage, their website is responsive? Semi, semi-responsive. Any, anybody know that there's this fully responsive? Kingston Unis is, OK? I'm going to try it later. <laughs> anybody else? So, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a funny field in that web design people are crazy about responsive websites. And everything's got to be responsive. And it's got to do this, and it's got to do that. Users, I'm not entirely sure, being perfectly honest with you, but in terms of the media stuff, I think it's important because it just means that you can have that peace of mind that if I embed it, it's going to work on all devices. If it's on a weird screen or a screen that's slightly smaller, it will work as well. So you don't really have to worry about that side of things. Responsive websites, you know, that's for another day at the end of the day. 
But yeah, it's interesting that there's only one that's here today that's got a truly responsive website because it is a real pain to do it. <laughs> This we introduced, this is following on from Chris's um, uh, presentation on LTI. So when Chris showed the, um, the LTI um, integrations in Moodle and Blackboard, you may remember that when he went to use the content, when he went to reply to the assignment as a student, he was immediately put into the form where he could upload content, and that was it. He didn't have any other option. He was just put in there, upload your content now. So we've had a lot of requests from people saying, well, why are you doing that? I mean, why, why can't a student create a body of work? Why, why can't they choose the thing that they've already uploaded? You're letting them upload it. Why can't they just have this, this way of accessing it? And we kind of thought about it and thought, well, there's not really a, a sort of a, a big driver behind restricting that. And actually, the ability for them to create a body of work in some courses is actually something that they want to have, like a kind of portfolio. So we now have the ability for a student to, to browse content that's in their personal category. So if they've uploaded it, they will be able to browse it and uh, reuse their last assignment submission for this assignment. Right? That's probably what they'll do. <laughs> yes, I've done it. So they can do that now. Uh, this is in V4 anyway. I don't know. Lee, is that, is that configurable? Did we make that configurable? Yeah. Yeah. So if you didn't want that and you only wanted a student to come in and be put straight into the upload form so they can just upload a video, you can turn this off. But if you have it on, a student will be able to select from whatever body of work they're creating through using the tool within LTI. OK, don't want to steal Chris's thunder. Webcam capture. Uh, just trying to think. What do you do? You want? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So. Um, this is what I'm going to do is I'm just going to walk through um, the webcam record function, which we've been mentioning for, for a lot of today. Um, I mean, this is really put in place for student feedback. If you've got lots of student submissions that you need to get back to and leave remarks and so forth, then hopefully this will help. And hopefully it's created in such a way that you can utilize it quickly and effectively without getting bogged down. The other thing that I, I think that we're we're also going to allow it to be used for is for students as well. So if a student wants to record themselves addressing the brief of an assignment, then they'll, they'll have that facility um, available to them as well. So today, um, it exists on our development environment, and I'm going to be walking you through how it works from the portal. So yeah, it'll be available as a feature both through LTI, but also through the portal if you're going to be using it traditionally. So. <clears throat> I'll log in as the administrator. Ah. Uh, you might do it in a different browser, don't do it in Chrome. Okay. There's some sort of funny thing going on with the Spanish. Who thinks the page is in Spanish? <laughs> You've got Firefox. Right, okay. Shall I, is there a way of zooming out a little bit? You have the, it's like a iOS sort of PC. Oh, yeah. Oh, right. No, I don't know. Why is it doing that? Is that in iOS as well? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Do you know what? I reckon it's somebody that's logged on to it and changed the language to Spanish then. Oh, yeah, right. Uh,
It's um, H3. Oh, is it? Yeah. Okay. Where Spanish comes in. <laughs> Oh, hang on, if they just change it to English. Yeah, yeah. Let's give it a go. <coughs> cool, yeah, so, cool. So, yeah, um, we, uh, what we had to do for this, this function to work um, properly is we slightly tweak the up process. So, instead of asking the user to define their media's metadata first of all and then browse for the file, we're giving the user the ability to browse for the file or upload from a webcam and then define the metadata, which I think is a slightly improved, more logical workflow. So once you've logged in, if you've got permissions to upload, oh, that's probably not relevant anymore because if you've, if you've got a personal category, you'll be able to do this. Um, you can choose either browse or webcam, so I'll go for webcam. And uh, that will then... So it uses this iteration, uses Flash to allow the webcam to start recording me. And what we've done is we've, we're getting a lot of feedback from um, people saying that their instructors prefer to be able to just give audio feedback instead of video. So we thought we'd include that option as well. So I'm going to go for video, though. You can see that it's selected the internal microphone and the camera, and I'm live. So we've got levelling here. When I'm finished addressing whatever I need to do, I'll click stop. And then I can either play the recording back for a preview, or if I need to, I can do... the internal microphone and the camera. Silence. Um, yeah, the, um, we can modify the start or the end points. So I could cut the beginning or, or the end out, sort of a top and tail. That is a destructive edit, so that will actually affect it going through the encoder to get those bits back again. So choose wisely when you, when you do, that, do that process. So I'll cancel that, but I'll go through and submit. And uh, <clears throat> go about defining as, as normal, really. Quite a few access to other categories. There's that um, little man... Uh, icon which Rob was mentioning about earlier. So if I wanted to upload content into a specific user's personal category, then I, I can do that. But that's an administrator only uh, permission or privilege. So you'll, you'll get a big list here. That's why we've included a search ultimately. Uh, I'm going to have to do it again, being too silly here. All right, let's go quickly. But yeah, I mean, it's, it, it, it'll, it'll just allow you to go right the way through the, the conventional process. You'll be able to select a thumbnail and um, it'll go into your, well, if you choose your personal category. It's quite a short recording. I'm surprised it managed to get as many thumbnails as it did. And away you go. So that's, that's the webcam capture. Now, the, the way it's going to appear in LTI is we're just going to include um, another button on that LTI menu. So users will have the ability to upload traditional, record through a webcam or search existing. So yeah, as few, as few mouse clicks as possible really, so that it's as easy to use as possible. Yep. That's it. point of view, I mean, the, the vast majority of people that I talk to say that this webcam capture thing is just going to be a huge deal because it just makes it really, really easy to produce the content. Um, and exactly what Chris was saying earlier about um, the, <clears throat> the ability to, to do that in a very quick way as well. So we, the, the eye opener for me, I guess, was we met with... Uh, uh, a university, it was actually here in London, and 
the woman was running, um, one of the women that we met with was running Blackboard and she just said to me, you know, we'd demoed this whole thing of doing a feedback uh, and we were sat there going, well, they just upload their feedback and, you know, they record it on their iPad and blah, blah, blah. And she just sat there and she just laughed, like, this is not going to happen. Like, people aren't going to sit there, record themselves, because it will happen in certain instances where they're giving one bit of feedback. But she said, these people have got a mark 60 assignment. So just having something that's very easy to do in that way, the feedback that I've had is that it will be a, a big kind of game changer. But my, my knowledge of this, having gone to university when people were still using pens and papers, is that I don't know actually how long a bit of feedback a lecturer would give. I mean, what, what, what is... You know, if you, if you had a, a video assignment that was produced as evidence of work and an instructor had 30 of them to mark, what sort of content would they create? Are we talking under a minute? Oh, up here... Yeah. So on a kind of essay, yeah. About eight to ten minutes. Yeah. But that's on a dissertation, right? So that's yeah. And that's tiring, so no, no longer than that. So fifteen minutes at most, if you were if you were re reviewing somebody's dissertation, but if it's just okay. But you would, do, you would do five minutes if it was just a standard sort of assignment. It isn't just a case that you'd go, oh, actually, I'll just say, yeah, it's really well thought out, la di da di da one minute, done. Yeah, the thing is, it just varies so much from person to person. Okay. But if you have 30 of them to do, and you had the choice between that and a glass of wine... <laughs> <laughs> no, but if you, seriously, if you had 30 of them to do, how long would you spend... Is it just that is how long is a piece of string type question? I, I spent about <coughs> 20 minutes reading, commenting, and then 10 minutes audio feedback. Okay. So I, I think that's quite a lot. That's quite a long time. Yeah. I, I think our staff are on a different planet. Right. We've turned it in as the ability to do an audio feedback and has three minutes, and I've never heard anybody complain that it wasn't good. Okay. So then there was an example earlier, wasn't there, where we were talking about... That was who was John was saying that, weren't you? Where you were saying that he was saying that they only listen to it if their mark is that was you, wasn't yeah. it? it was, yeah. No, but never a true word spoken in jest, right? So you're saying that if they wouldn't even they wouldn't listen to it unless the, the mark was markedly higher or lower. It's gonna be interesting with this if you can actually look to see whether people are inflamed. Yeah. That's yeah, yeah, the stats. Yeah. Should, should, we, should, we, should we limit it? No. <laughs> yeah. there, there isn't a limit, as far as I'm aware, Lee, of what we're using. There isn't a limit to the size of the recording. There's a... Well... Yeah, we have a limit of two gigs in terms of what can be uploaded, but that wouldn't affect what can be captured there because it's not going through our upload. Yeah, so you could, in theory, do something as big as you like. It wouldn't matter. The, I I would preface that by saying that <laughs> it's not it's not an issue of size. What it is is quality, actually, because that as much as we can tweak it. That is not brilliant quality. So that is, is, is captured, it's through Flash, and we've tweaked it as much as we can, and we still don't get brilliant quality. It, and it, we thought originally, oh, it's something to do with a webcam. Let's buy a 1080p webcam. And it really didn't make that much difference, did it? The, the sort of webcam we had, we had a 720p webcam, really good one, did it, did it with a worse one, didn't really look that much different. So you, I don't... <laughs> it's a, it is a Flash thing. Yeah, so I don't know. I mean, it's it's feasible that you could do it, but I don't know whether the quality of content that you would get would be good enough. But it depends whether you're interested in quality or just the fact that it can be done. So 
Okay, so we've got, we've got variants here. Andy, you're saying less than three minutes at most. Well, that's so feedback on an essay. On an essay. Yeah. Okay. Which, so it's not feedback on a video. Right, okay. But feedback, well, arguably feedback on an essay would probably be longer than on a video. Arguably. So what we got at the back, Phil? Yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, the Turnitin thing is slightly different, isn't it? Because the Turnitin, all your feedback is going to be kind of a summary. You know, you've already gone through your marketing assignment. Yeah. And then you get a summary. I suppose it depends if the audio or video feedback is the only form of feedback you get. Right, got you. It's going to be a bit longer, isn't it? Yeah. Watch them for so long that the quality isn't excellent, you yeah. Know, so it's the, the quality will only lend itself up to kind of you know a certain length of time before students won't be able to kind of watch it for any longer. So. <laughs> you just can't be bothered to watch a grainy picture, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah, yeah, got you. Okay, sorry, you were gonna say, yep. A lot of kind of free tools that let you do audio and screencast yeah. feedback, and they so Jing, for example, yeah, is yeah, used a lot at our institution. It limits it at five minutes, and that's yeah. the free one. Yeah. We've outgrown that five minutes, which is why limiting yeah. it at something like that would be quite sort of problematic. I think. I think the answer to the question is it just varies, doesn't it? It varies on the type of content, the institution, what you're what you're doing. It is it is varying. I. I always thought that it would be something that would be used in a relatively short context, but if not, I mean, it's, it can be used for whatever length you want, really. Just thinking, another another aspect of the feedback is I know quite a few tutors will uh, mark the whole set of work, and then they'll have feedback to the group. The group. So it's part of that. It's like the end of the marking workflow is yeah. actually giving some feedback to the group. Yeah. So thinking about how they do that through Moodle would be useful. Yeah, they. I get. I mean, we haven't we we haven't designed it with that in mind, but I suppose there there must be somewhere within Moodle where they could upload through the text editor and share a video, couldn't they? So, so I don't know. I mean, where would that be in Moodle? Just out of interest, what what sort of what sort of forum would you put it in? Is it literally a forum like I've just I said? Guess, yeah, I guess it varies a lot as to yeah. whether they they have got a very forum based approach, in yeah. which, which case they probably have got somewhere yeah. clear to do it. Shared but out. I can imagine them using the web tool. To to do that because yeah. they're thinking in terms of the feedback bit and then just moving to a different a different uh, bit of the course and doing it there so I can imagine them doing that all connected yeah 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 no, it's interesting I think you know we kind of had to do it because people were asking about it all the time and that that's a very good sign of what you should do but we just we haven't really envisaged exactly how people are going to use it but it's interesting that there's such a wide range but it makes sense because there's such a wide range of things that could potentially be submitted so I, that does make sense to me. Okay, is there any more questions on the webcam capture specifically? If not, I'm gonna go on to the, the live streaming. Nope, okay. Okay, live streaming. <coughs> Have I got any slides on this? Okay, so the media library today is an on-demand video system, i.e. it's not live. The only way that you had before of putting a live stream in the media library is you could create a link on this menu uh, on the left-hand side here. You could create a link to anything you wanted, and normally that links menu people would use to link off to their Moodle, or I've seen some people linking off to their TV recording service, for example. So you could do it that way, but it wasn't really that elegant. You kind of had to figure out how you'd embed a live stream and do all of that work, and most people just didn't do it, really. So what we've done with this live streaming feature is we've taken the, um, the pain out of it, really. So when you do live streaming as a kind of concept is that you have to have something, like a camera or, or whatever, that's actually filming it, you would normally plug that camera into what you'd call an encoder, which is taking that raw video and turning it into something that can be broadcast to a server. <clears throat> and then the server would stream that content out to the end user. So it's quite, <clears throat> I mean, it's the sort of thing that, you know, we would, we would normally charge 
somebody to do and we'd say, look, do you want to do this live streaming? We'll come out for a day or a couple of days. We'll show you how it works. We'll look at all the intricacies of it. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera, and we'll build this sort of web page for you. And it's it's a little bit clunky, and it's something that you've got to know quite a lot in order. So what we were looking to do with this live streaming feature was to say, if you've got a live feed running and you've got your encoder set up and you've clicked to go, the next stage is then how do I display that in a web page or how do I archive what I've done once I've finished with it? And that is just a manual process. That's just a case of taking your file, as I'm going to do today, actually, and all this stuff that I've um, been recording as we go, I'm going to upload this to our media library. And it's not, not really that, uh, you know, it's not a great process. It's not that streamlined. So we've sought to, firstly, allow people to display live channels in the media library. So here you've got your kind of all your live channels that are going at a particular time and all of the stuff that's scheduled coming up. I mean, in reality, most people aren't going to have tons and tons of stuff here. But I do have people that, you know, would want to show, I don't know, rolling news or, or, maybe, or maybe just a, a video about the university, like a promotional video that's on a loop or something like that. So they might, they might have that sort of content on this page. And then you can feature a live event here as well if you want to. So this could be, we're talking about these lunchtime lectures, the chap at the back there, you could well... Put your, you could point people at this as their lunchtime lecture and place to go. And we made the URL of this page very simple. It's basically the media library address slash live. So it's quite, you know, I'm not saying it's highly brandable, but it's one of those sort of things where people have just got to remember slash live, that's it, and they would get to that page. So that's where you display the live feeds. If I click on this particular live feed, I mean, there's nothing running at the moment, but you'll see it's, a, it's the same sort of web page, but this will show the live feed on it. On the right hand side there, you can make this page customizable. So one of the things that you can do on the right hand side, I'll show all of the things you can do in a minute. But one of the things that I thought was probably most interesting about this was you could have a Twitter feed going on on the right hand side there, very much like the, um, <coughs> the BBC's website where you kind of get this kind of rolling Twitter feed along the side of a bit of content. You can do that. So say if you had a live um, stream going, you could say what the Twitter, so I don't know the Twitter terminology, hashtag is it? The Twitter hashtag was, and then people would be making comments against that Twitter, Twitter hashtag, and it would appear as a rolling Twitter feed alongside the live stream. So, you know, for, a, for a, an event where you get a guest speaker coming along, that could be quite a cool thing as well. Other things that you can do, uh, so if I log in, Let's go to live streaming. So the settings uh, are here. I mean, this is, we're getting into quite technical stuff here, but you can use a whole range of different encoders with this particular feature. So if you're running, let's say, the Adobe Flash Media Encoder, you can define what the URL, how the URLs are constructed. So we've done the hard work for people in that this is the default way that all these encoders work, unless you mess about with them. So this here, if you never change the screen and you never change the default settings on your encoder, this would all work. Once you start messing around with this, you're then going to start getting into issues. So we've done all of this hard work to say that when the embed code is populated, all of the particular different devices will work because we've done all the hard work for you figuring out what all the links are going to be to that content. So this is kind of an embed code builder almost. And this is something that I myself, I just go with the defaults on everything. So I would never touch something like this. But we had to provide the flexibility here just in case people did want to change it. You can then decide, um, if you want to, you can put in a kind of API URL of your, your streaming server, and that means that we can tell how many people are connected to the live feed at a particular point in time, and we can display that on the page. And you can also decide where the content 
uh, the, the kind of the watch folder for the archive of the content. So that path there, you'll see it says C archive. That's the path on the server that's looking for content coming in and will uh, and will um, ingest anything that goes there and put it into a live category, into an archived category. So it's quite cool in that if you did a live event and then you press stop on your encoder, this will archive it to a particular category um, automatically. There's no need for you to upload the content and it will take all of the metadata from uh, the live feed. When you create the live feed, you put in the metadata, it will take all of that and put it into the media library as well. So it's seamless from the point of view of doing your live stream, ending your live stream, and then it's available once it's encoded it, once it's converted it, it will be available. So those are the live settings. That's sort of more boring technical stuff. The live channels, setting up a live channel. So if we go here, add new, you'll see the sort of options that are available. You've got obviously the name of the live stream, the description. This is all the stuff that's going into the media library. This is the metadata that's getting ingested once your live stream's over. The target category is where it outputs the archived uh, copy of the live event to, and you can choose that. And then you can in choose the, um, the type of encoder that you're using um, and whether, whether it's just an audio live event as well. If you choose that, it will just display a, a, an audio live feed rather than a video live feed. That's important in, a, in that the embedded player that is created by doing that, the audio one, you can define the kind of the thumbnail for it. So if you do an audio live event, you don't, you don't necessarily just want the controls of the player, although you could do that. You might want the controls of the player and then maybe, you know, a publicity shot of the speaker that's, that's doing it, possibly. <clears throat> so you can, you can do an audio only one, but you can have control over the thumbnail of the clip. You can, what else can you do that's interesting here? The Twitter stuff I mentioned already. If you want to, some people want to do this. Where is it? Cast where? Show embed code. Yes. I can't see it now. Oh yes, sorry. Right at the top. Use custom embed code. So, if you're if you're a kind of advanced user and you don't want to go with the embed code that we create, and you'll say, I don't know, I can think of an example of one of the customers that I've got that says, we've got a multicast enabled network, and we want to do this live stream that's all multicast enabled, and we're going to do it through real player or Windows media player or whatever. And you just want to display that live feed within a media library page and make it look like a media library page with a live feed running, you can cut and paste your own embed code into this area, and then it will show whatever embedded player you've created. It doesn't matter. What, whatever you want to do, it will show it within that page. So it's more of an advanced user type thing. But when we're creating this live channel, all that we're doing is we're telling it where, where, where it's going to archive it to, whether we want it to be featured, whether we want it available all the time, or we only want it available in a certain time or a date range. And we can define that. Who we want it to be available to. So your lunchtime lectures you might want only available to specific groups of people in your AD and you would define those here. And then whether you want it available to just people on certain IP addresses as well. We can even get as granular as that in terms of the security. Once you're done with all of that and you've configured it all, what you're then doing is you're cut and pasting this live stream name here that you've created and then you're putting that into whatever encoding bit of software you're using. Now, unfortunately, I don't have any encoding software on this PC. I could potentially show you on this Helix webcaster. Let's do that. Here we go. So this is an encoder, this, this webcaster software. And most of them have this kind of typical setup of you define the streaming server that you're pushing it to, and you define the stream name. So you put in the stream name that we've set up, and you define the streaming server. Let's just call it helix.streaming.co.uk. This would be the name of your, your streaming server that underlies your, your um, media library. And then you click go, and you start broadcasting. 
you go back to your web page. Let's go up there. Go back to your web page. Let's leave that. We won't save that one. Uh, where are we live now? And then the stream would be running through this page. Unfortunately, it's not a very impressive demo because I haven't got this actually running. But your live stream would be running through this page here. And that's the one that, that has the same URLs as what we've, what we've set up. So it does rely on, on some specialist knowledge because you've got to be a tech person that knows how an encoder works. But essentially, what we're giving you with the media library is we're saying all of that effort that you'd have to do to create that web page environment and the, the, the authentication around it and to get it to work on all these different devices, we're doing all that bit for you, and then we're giving you the name of the file. You would then give that to your person that's doing the live streaming and say, look, when you do the live stream, just use this name of the file and point it at this server. That's it. OK, thanks very much and then you'd go to that page and it would be running there. When he clicks stop on his encoder, it then archives it off to the media library as well. So it's to, kind of, it's to simplify the process, but I'm not going to make out like the process of doing a live stream is totally simple because you know, we can't get around the fact that people still need boxes that do encoding and they need cards that you feed camera feeds into. Today, I mean, if you look at the amount of spaghetti that I've got on the desk here, and I'm not even doing a live stream, so <laughs> I'm actually just recording it. So is there anyone here? I mean, there was a chap at the front here who was actually doing a live stream from his mobile, right? So what have you done recently by way of a live stream? What, what, have, you, what have you been up to? Uh, we're doing, we've got a graduation next week. Yep. So we're just to see how to go about that. Yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we yesterday. Okay. And it is? Yeah, fine. Good. So would something like that have helped? I mean, I'm not, yeah. it's a leading question, I know, it but, would have done yeah. It would have been really good. Yeah. <laughs> right, okay. We just weren't quick enough, yeah. No, yeah, quick enough. yeah. But we're there now. Yeah. So, and, and I think more people will, will do it more often um, and with greater ease in yeah. the future. Especially with, um, with this, yeah. It's half the battle, I think, just knowing how you create the embedded player. That's it. When I've done work for people, we've had people that would call us up. Because, I mean, we're a streaming business as well as doing the media library. And people would just call us up and say, well, I don't know how to do live streaming. Tell me how to do it. And I said, well, it's not that difficult. And they kind of they get to a point where they're like you. They need that help to do it. And then they need to understand how to embed it in a web page. And as soon as you it's clicked. It's kind of, well, I don't need you anymore. You know, they don't need us anymore to do it. But something like this, I think, just makes it easier. Because if I'd have just said to you, actually, all you need to do is get your, you know, you've got to buy your card and you've got to put your camera into it. But then you click go and just use this name. That's it. It would have been simpler. And I think this almost, you know, we could continue selling time to help people doing it. But this is actually... It makes it simpler, I think. I don't know how much simpler we could make it. That's the thing. I'm not... Because when you start getting into encoding live video, it's not... You know, we get a lot of people say to us, can you make something like Ustream, for example, where you can just stream live through a browser? But that's not what re people are really after for these events, like a lunchtime lecture. They wouldn't want somebody just to sit there and go, click, go, done, because it wouldn't be high enough quality. Any other questions on live streaming? Of the distance of if I want university radio. Yeah? So I would make an audio stream with a caption saying yeah. uh, whatever my student radio service is going to be and we will go with that. Yeah, I would just, on that live now, yes. you would just set up a, an audio stream and then you would just have it there cool. constantly yeah. all the time. And, and audio streaming, it's, it's, it's exactly the same as video streaming, yeah. but in your encoder you just don't select a video source, that's it, and then you click go and it comes through the player in exactly the same way. So it's, yeah. We'll help you with it, John, don't worry. <laughs> as long as you buy us a beer. Does that audio always get saved? Or can it be just play and then gone? You don't have to archive if you don't want to, no. Yeah. 
That is a good question, actually. I think that's a potential use case. Have we thought about that? I'm just trying to think. If you had an audio stream that was running all the time, you just wouldn't archive it, would you? Or is the archive a global archive? Um, it's a global setting, isn't it? Um, I don't think there is a setting to turn it on and off. That is a good question. On a live, I think we're going to have to change it. Yeah. I think there's a potential bug there. Yeah, it's a good point because I think at the moment the archiving is purely global, isn't it? If you had something that was running all the time, I mean, it would, it would archive it after a while because an encoder comes to a point where it has so much in the buffer that it just goes gajunk. There's, I think there's this, I mean, in the Helix producer, for example, it's two gigs, so it'll only, it will get to a point where it will just stop. Um, that's more of, yeah, but that's only if you were archiving it locally to a machine. So yeah, no, it's a good point actually. We should make that on a per. Yeah. Yeah. On the channel. Yeah. Live channel. Who's thinking of the easiest way of developing it? <laughs> aren't you? <laughs> we need to change it. Good point. That's what user groups are for, right? Though. <laughs> Any other questions? Live streaming. Yep. Could you say this is a time stream? Sorry to... So timed stream. Timed stream. So you can set a time for it to stream at a certain time, like 2 o'clock to 4 o'clock, yes. every Friday, Monday to Friday, and only record that. Oh, that. only record at that particular time. You can't do that currently. <coughs> um, but, yeah, it's a good point. So what would, what would be the application there, like a security camera or something? Or? No, I think more, we're setting up a student radio station, but they want to make me broadcast at certain times. <laughs> and the lecturer, the lecturer will probably want to keep a copy of that yeah. recording uh, yeah. to mark it later on, if anything else. Okay, so they would assess. So student radio is something, another thing that would be assessed. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's possible. Because they're doing it through journalism as opposed to just a radio station that's yeah, a student union. Yeah. You're writing all these down, Lee. Yeah. The other thing radio service or the university radio service, in some cases you're obliged to keep a recording if yeah. you're playing commercial music, for yeah, example, yeah, it's true. depending on the license you have. Yeah. So it might not be at the world's greatest quality, but I think you do sometimes need to keep a record. Yeah, you'd have to keep an archive of it yeah. as well. Yeah, it's going to be a big old media library, isn't it, after a while, all of that stuff. Wow. Anything else on live streaming? So can you change settings, or are they kind of generic? Like, uh, say, for instance, screen resolution or bit rate? You would do that in your encoder, yeah. So you'd, and you, you could do whatever you like in your encoder. So, for example, if you wanted a, a multi-bit rate stream that it, it goes into, you know, so you, so you could define a multi-bit rate stream that's got lots of different qualities in it, and it would yep. hook into whichever one. You could do it that way. You could okay. do, just do it at one quality if you want as well. Okay. But it's all done in the encoder rather than in our software. Okay. We're sort of just displaying whatever's the encoder's pushing through. We did have... Um, I know that um, we had... Uh, some questions around that from a customer in in Germany, and in the end we we put together something that will when we document this a kind of recommended settings as well because one of the things that this chap was saying was <clears throat> if you give people a totally free reign and you don't make any recommendations for the encoder settings you're going to get something that's kind of weird and wonderful and you're going to get a lot of support issues on it and people are going to go oh well I did this and it, it didn't look right. So we, we've got a list of, of stuff that it will look good with and, and the best way of doing it, which we'll, we'll include with the documentation. No, you could use whatever you want. There's a list of ones there. You've got, you could use, um, I mean, the most popular ones are normally the RTP encoders. So that's a, a li on the list there as well. So you could use that. I mean, we're covering pretty much anything because actually, if you went to the Adobe one, and you just swapped out the values for whatever the link URLs are, you, you could use whatever you like. It's, we're just providing a means of populating those, that URL formatting into some embed code. So we're just kind of looking at the popular ones and just saying, well, here are the defaults, but you can use what you like. RTP encoders is the bottom option. That's the one when people buy these appliances. They seem to be RTP encoders, so it works like that. No allegiance to... Anything really. <laughs> as long as it works. Yeah. Okay. Any others? No? All done on live streaming? Cool. Great. All right.
Let's move on to, let me stop this. We'll move on to some scaling. 